You know what they say, never count a Hogan out because their shoulders don't stay pinned to the mat long enough. In the past, I've covered all four seasons of the tragic train wreck that was Hogan Knows Best, which were four full seasons of hindsight horrors that finally came to an end when the Hogans went through a very brutal and very public divorce. This wouldn't only terminate the Hogan's marriage, but also the Hogan Knows Best brand as well. But VH1 wasn't quite done riding the Hulkster's coattails, and Hulk Hogan wasn't quite done utilizing VH1 to keep his hopeful pop star daughter in the spotlight. So in the ashes of Hogan Knows Best spawned the spin-off slash sequel, Brooke Knows Best. Now truth be told, this is actually my first time watching this series. While I do have fond memories of the bizarre badness that was that first show, I am a complete stranger to this particular strangeness. Let's just take the time to take a deep breath before taking this deep dive into what could potentially be yet another Hogan reality TV dumpster fire. I just want you to be forewarned, we're not throwing work and punches with this one. The show doesn't avoid the then-recent public Hogan drama and controversies. The show immediately spends its introduction not necessarily reintroducing Brooke, but instead presenting a recap and highlight reel of all things wrong with the name Hogan in 2008. We're talking Hulk and Linda's nasty divorce, Nick's drunk driving accident, we're talking everything short of Hulk hitting his finish on his daughter's best friend. What's clear in the opening montage of Past, Present, and Future, it's that Hulk and Linda are fighting for their daughter's love from a distance. The coming attractions for the first episode and the terrible opening basically point blank confirm this. Honestly, I'll be real with you. I'm already invested. We're only a couple seconds in here. I already think that this, along with the original Hogan Knows Best, should really, it really needs to be in a museum. It should be studied. This is the most uncomfortable portion of someone's family life captured for all to see. It seems bizarre and borderline heartlessly opportunistic to put this family in the limelight right after their time in the limelight helped end their marriage. I think time away from the spotlight would have been beneficial to everyone involved's mental health. I'm just saying they clearly needed to take a mulligan. But instead they invited the cameras into one of the most tragic times in all their lives. To all the smart guys in the comment section telling me that reality TV is scripted? Yeah, dude. Yeah, I get it. But the Hogan's car accident, their divorce, Brooke's mess of a career, and the overall beating they took in the tabloids during the time was not. I would never say that reality TV was reality, but I will say that it's based in and on reality, and its presence has the ability to change one's reality. I think it just probably would have been for everyone's best interest to just take a break and reassess the situation. It's clear that Brooke was chosen to be spun off because A, she was the one the family and the show were actively trying to promote as being a star, and much more importantly, B, she was the only Hogan family member who wasn't wrapped up in some kind of controversy. Still, even with the show following around Brooke as she tries to distance herself from the PR nightmare that are her parents and brother, it's very evident that the show is still actively banking on the bad press that the Hogans gather up in the background. Their real-life rivalry is absolutely the core of this show, even if Brooke is the one that's standing at the centerfold. So now that you've been forewarned, let's just get right into it. Episode 1, Moving In. Brooke's moving on out, which is probably the best move for her when you think about it. I mean, put yourself in her shoes for a moment. I mean, you're probably not the right size, but try to squeeze them on in there. Your parents just got a divorce, you're 20 years old, your brother's in prison, so he didn't have to pick who he wants to live with. You're gonna hurt one of your overbearing parents one way or another. If you go with mom, dad will be heartbroken. If you go with dad, mom will be heartbroken. The best thing to do in that situation is probably to get on out and live your own life. Plus, I don't think she'd really want to live with her dad and then have to hear him wrestling one of her friends at night. Or live with her mom and hear her wrestling with one of her brother's friends at night. Man, that family is fucked, dude. You know, just overall bad situation. This was the best call. And moving out on your own may mean you get to extend your 15 minutes of fame. So yeah, this was the best call. This is an overall uh, best case scenario in a worst case scenario situation. Brooke shows her father around her expensive new place to which the huckster offers to be her third roommate. Now normally I'd laugh this off and think he was joking, but I know this family, and quite frankly, I would not doubt that he's entirely serious. And he is. 
It's like they got each other in a chokehold and they're not letting go even if the refs get to three. Brooke, of course, says no and denies this because she wants to walk around naked. To which Hogan responds... People have telescopes. People have night vision cameras. You know, people can, you know, drop down a rappel from a helicopter and hit the balcony. I mean, somebody can hang glide right into your bedroom. You need to be careful. Right, so, so don't ever be nude. A shower in a bikini. You know, just, just in case. You know what? Just to be secure, let's, let's make it a one-piece. You never know. I, I don't trust people. Hulk continues to try and lay the law down by insisting that Brooke doesn't invite too many people over in her hot tub because that's how people catch diseases. What in the name of pillow pants is this man talking about? The topic shifts to Hogan's divorce, which my spider sense tells me may just be a reoccurring occurrence on the show. Hulk doesn't offer heated words toward his ex-wife. He approaches the subject matter rather calmly and unbiased. But it does feel rather rehearsed. Just worry about your mom and Nick are okay, because I know they're still going through stuff. Your mom's a strong woman. You know, she, she always makes her own choices, though she's doing the right thing for her. Whether it was in the script or the huckster was just going into business for himself again, who's really to say? You don't know which one to believe, which one to trust, which side to take. And it's like, I don't want to have to take sides. Either way, it, it definitely didn't feel like those were his true feelings. It felt like... Uh, this is what I'm going to say because there is a camera in my face. And we all know how Hulk Hogan really talks when he doesn't know there's a camera in his face. Brooke brings up Nick, saying that she wishes he could be there. They sort of mention his troubles, but they do so discreetly and try to portray Nick as a good kid who's just made some mistakes. Nick's good. a good boy. I just, He's I wish awesome. he could come down here with me. I wish he could be my third roommate. I want you to keep in mind that during this time period, Nick couldn't be Brooke's roommate because he was someone else's cellmate. I really want to believe that everybody can change, especially when people have done stuff in their younger years. I think it's very easy to make mistakes when you're not fully developed, when you're still, you're not a fully realized person. But I don't think Nick is one of those people who change. His actions led to someone else getting seriously injured and their life being forever impacted by the incident. And during that time, Nick Hogan showed no remorse. Well. I don't know what type of person John was or what he did to get himself in the situation. I know he was pretty aggressive and used to yell at people and used to do stuff. And, but some, some, for some reason, man, God laid some heavy on a kid. He's a negative person. As a matter of fact, Nick was lobbying to get his own spinoff show when he was behind bars. Will you work on that reality deal? Yep. Reality, how I'm getting back on my feet and... Uh, Albert Company after the celebrity out of jail. That thing lined up, so the minute I walk out of wherever I walk out of... Can you do it while you're on probation? Yeah, of course. I want to do it where I'll make the most money. We call it the new Nick or something. New Nick. We'll have to come up with a good name. Think of a good name. I'll be thinking of a good name. Nick is, you know, being accountable. I know that he's incapable of taking back what he did, and maybe the guy has grown and matured as a person. I'm just trying to point out that despite what the family may have portrayed, Nick was certainly not a good guy who did bad things. He was actually a little bit of a brat, to say the very least. The serious talk breaks down when Brooke's friend and roommate, Glenn, arrives. They may be wondering why Hollywood over here is alright with his daughter having a male roommate. And the answer is, because he's gay. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Trick question. Trick answer. Uh, it doesn't matter that he's gay. Hulk Hogan still doesn't trust it. This is a man who has seen far too many swerves in his life. But I mean, you're you're gay, which is cool, you know, but I mean, is there like a weird gray area? Definitely, for sure, I am. Quiring minds want to know, gay. I really want to believe that this moment was scripted. And once again, if this was any other reality TV show with any other reality TV personality, I would think that it was. But with Hulk, the man who has been proved to be legitimately territorial when it comes to his own daughter, yeah, I, I, I just don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think so. But what I do know is that work or shoot, it's all Terry. During this interrogation, Brooke is upstairs talking on the phone to the other half of her parents' broken marriage, setting up a day for her to come by and making sure that she doesn't bump into her father. Later, Hulk Hogan does what any rational-minded parent whose child just moved out does, check to see if the place directly next to them is available. The house next to my daughter, it's available, isn't it? It's open. It is available. This show about this family is like if Everybody Loves Raymond was a documentary. 
He also asked the dude at the security desk to keep an eye on his daughter. Hey, how's it going? Maybe I will take that pen out. Maybe you will. The following day, Brooke, her roommate, and the Hulkster go out shopping for her new place. Colored hangers. Colored. These are That's got to be racist. And it cannot be overlooked that Hulk Hogan has in this episode made two separate references to saying prayers and eating vitamins. He's praying. Oh, you guys get your vitamins. I got to go get a couple things for myself. I'm sorry. I didn't know where else to put it, but uh, it was going somewhere in this video. Brooke does what every child does and not so subtly guilts their parent into getting them what they want. So Hulk's card is the one that's charged. Hulk, however, thinks that this is a sign of good faith. So he then proceeds to try to leverage his daughter and her friend to be the third roommate. You know what? I don't understand why all of a sudden I can't qualify for the third roommate. To which they politely decline. Hulk continues to try and make his point into the morning by helping secure the house. Which means stocking it with weapons and fixing things that aren't really broken in the first place. Usually breaking them as he does so. Brooke eventually sends her father home sad, and I am at a loss for words. This is only episode one. I was worried that this show was going to be a downgrade from the first one. But it's not. It's not. It's, it's on the level. It's the same Hogan's. It's the same Hogan madness. It's just, it's the same. Let's keep that in mind as we go into episode two, best roommate ever. So while the Hulkster didn't become the three in this three's company, that role still needed to be filled looking for roommates online well i wouldn't be going online looking for roommates i would pick somebody that's i can trust well what's wrong with me for a roommate they put together a pretty awfully worded ad and posted out in the public no freak supply that's a selfie but as it turns out the most important qualifications to be roomies with the second most talented hogan kid is that you need to be attractive if you're not hot that's it you're out I don't care what your credit score is, I don't care if you will or won't pay rent. As you might imagine, the candidates are of course cartoony and comical. There are more mishaps here than anything else. But I'll be real with y'all, Brooke and Glenn come off worse than anybody who comes through the door. They seem like the most insufferable people, and I can't imagine anybody would actually want to live with them. Like, I know this is all staged, but... Why would you intentionally make your leads look so annoying and awful? Like, they have Brooke be offended when someone isn't familiar with her work. You know who Brooke Hogan is? Oh, I love the music and I listen to everything that's okay. catching me in the ear. Brooke Hogan must not have hit her in the ear. You should really learn about Brooke Hogan. And I really hope the real Brooke Hogan doesn't act that way when someone doesn't know who she is, because otherwise, she's going to be living a pretty unfortunate existence. You know, I mean, we know who your dad is. Everyone knows him. They don't, they don't really care that much about you, though, you know. It's because your parent is famous doesn't mean that you have to be. Actually, a lot of time probably means you shouldn't. Glenn and Brooke are very judgmental of all those that apply. The two ask really invasive questions and then act grossed out or put off by the answers they were prying for. If the goal of the scene is to get across just how strange the outside world is to the level-headed Brooke and Glenn, then it failed. Because I would rather spend a day with any one of those other people that sat across the table from them than sit through a meal with these two. Watching the two of them look down at those they sit across from isn't exactly endearing to either party. But luckily we have Brooke's brilliant take on women in politics to completely win me back over. I actually am not that into voting. I think that it's kind of crazy that a woman is running because I think women deal on emotions and menopause and PMS. Whoa! I know Brooke Hogan was so based. That was sarcasm before you uh, write me a heavily worded letter. I'm actually kind of upset that they stopped it where they did because if we would have let her go on for 20 seconds longer, I guarantee you she'd circle around to, I don't even know why we're allowed to vote, which is uh, amazing. So someone asked Brooke Hogan if, uh, if her worldviews have changed since this. I'm very curious. I hope they haven't, but I fear they might have. It's a weird choice, uh, because this doesn't make them fun. This makes them f Oops. You're not trying to find a suitable candidate to play bedroom bumper cars. You're not even looking for a buddy. You're looking for someone who will help you pay rent. Someone that you could imagine sharing a living space with and not aliving in their sleep. That's what having a roommate is. Brooke announces and then reiterates her disgust at people having, um... <clears throat> 
since this is a wrestling video, let's call them three-way dances. Which leads to Glenn accusing her of never having a one-on-one -on -one singles match. But Brooke responds that she's most definitely had a singles match before it just happened in Rio de Janeiro. There's some deep cuts for the marks out there. The following day, Brooke's mom Linda stops by to make her contractual cameo. She gives her mom a quick tour of the house, but Linda's unsurprisingly much more interested in getting a tan. The mother and daughter duo take to the beach where Brooke questions her mother on how she's handling divorce. The answer? Not well, apparently. I'm kidding, she's fine a millisecond later. Following that, Brooke randomly announces to Glenn that her friend Ashley will be moving in as the third roommate. And one scene later, she does. The episode ends with Hulk sending his daughter a life-size cardboard cutout of himself. Oh, Hulk. You shouldn't have. No, no, I mean, really, you, you, you shouldn't. Like, why would you do that? Shades of Dwayne Johnson with this one. Hulk calls his daughter up, hoping she got his gift. I thought you might be missing me as much as I'm missing you. Put this in the foyer so anyone coming off the elevator will know who they're dealing with. That's kind of weird. Huh? This is sweet, but just kind of strange. I think it, you know, captured the essence of my handsomeness. Well, it's a really tough adjustment. I feel like I, you know, lost my best friend. Lost part of my life. Guys, yeah, come on. Guys, it's getting creepy. Just cut the cord. Cut the damn cord, man! They celebrate by going out to a club. With Glenn wearing a bedazzled Ed Hardy jacket. Uh, Glenn, buddy, come on, come on, man. I wear pajamas all day, and I know that's not a look. I, it's not a good look for anyone. I don't care if it is 2008. It's, it's still not the time or place. There, it will never be the time. And there will never be the place. It was a mistake even then. Anyway, over the course of the night, Brooke gets a bunch of numbers and just has a good time with her friends. Tonight was a testament of exactly what this year is going to be about. Oh, what a way to end. Episode 3, House Party. Brooke decides that she wants to throw a housewarming party and starts her invite list with hot strangers. But that same list also consists of Stax, a name you might be familiar with as he previously appeared in Hogan Knows Best. Although on that show, he was only shown to be Nick's best friend. But apparently off-air and in between seasons, Stax and Brooke dated and then broke up. Brooke does what any child would not do, even in their adult years, and tells her father that she's having a party. Hulk obviously objects, but his objections fall on deaf ears. Must be hereditary. While he's not shockingly dismayed about the prospect of Brooke having a gathering, he's more upset that she invited Stax. And her friends mirror this sentiment as well, telling her that it's a mistake to both have the past and future present at your party. Noting that having her ex there, and a guy that she's potentially interested in, is a recipe for disaster. I don't think the episode ever does a good job at explaining why Brooke would even think doing this would be a good idea in the first place. But you know, I'm not going to complain, because whatever gets us through these episodes faster, I I'm in favor of. C cut it all. Cut everything. Let's just credits. That's I'm, I'm fine with it. The group go shopping at Party City for PG party favors, but it seems like Brooke doesn't have the greatest concept of what a party for adults actually looks like. Uh, but then again, uh, nobody else does either, so that's, that's fine. She's in good, bad company. The episode is so by the numbers and step-by-step -step formulaic that you could probably guess what happens in it based on a million other stories you've seen before. Party grows to a surprising number, the house gets trashed, Main character and friends try to take control of the party while also desperately trying to keep two people apart at the party. It is everything that you'd expect, and it is every bit as basic as it sounds. Stack shows up, and Damien, the hot stranger, is hidden upstairs as if he's in the middle of playing a one-sided game of hide-and-seek. In the meantime, Stack shows Brooke's roommate Ashley the slightest bit of attention, and it's enough to set Brooke off and completely ruin her day. She becomes very over-the-top in her jealousy, acting out and even giving her best friend the cold shoulder as if somehow she's at fault for Stax remembering that she existed. You know, I'm not a psychologist or anything, but I don't think that she's quite as over him as she says she is. Brooke questions Stax on how he's acting with Ashley, Stax questions Brooke on how she's acting with Damien, Stax takes his leave, and Brooke makes her way back to the bedroom for a private breakdown. Luckily for her, her friend Glenn is there with a pep talk and she's immediately in pursuit of Damien. This poor guy didn't even know that he's the consolation prize. And that's Damien, who I'm now realizing looks a lot less like a Damien 
and a lot more like a Skippy. So Brooke and Peter Pan over here spend some more time together and just enjoy each other's company, with Brooke prioritizing spending time with him over policing her party. When she re-enters her home, she realizes just how out of hand things have gotten. And to make matters even worse, they almost ruined her cardboard cutout of her father! Security gets called due to noise complaints following things getting broken, and Brooke has the party evacuated. Later, Skippy returns remembering he forgot to kiss the girl. That's kind of cute cheesy, uh, but cute. The episode could end there, but of course it doesn't. Because we need to end this episode with a weird phone call between Brooke and Hulk where Hulk tells her to get a blood test because she shared a hot tub with a couple of people. Of course! Episode 4, Spring Break Smackdown. This episode starts with Hulk making a call to his daughter, telling her how much he misses her. I'd love to see you. I, you know, I know you know, you're going to be working, but maybe I can come along. Your dad's not normal. Listen, Hulk Hogan, a, your little bird just left the nest. Let her fly free for a little bit before asking her to make a visit. The show is such a sad sequel because it's about a broken family and two parents desperately seeking their daughter's validation and competing for her love. It's, it's like everything from the first show, but like significantly sadder. Like if Hogan Knows Best was too upbeat for you, don't worry, we got just the thing. Let's, let's all get real sad real quick. Unsurprisingly, Hulk isn't happy to hear that his daughter's hosting a spring break event. So he guilt trips his way into being a part of that trip. And because Brooke said that she'll be busy half the time he's there, Hulk decides to bring a friend. You are awarded no points for guessing who that friend is correctly, because it is obviously, of course, Brian Nobbs. Nobbs, as usual, makes a scene, as he's known to do, embarrassing Brooke and her roommates, which will be a running theme in this episode. When a bunch of guys are hitting on Brooke, Hulk lets them know that that doesn't work for me, brother. So he and Nobbs make them evacuate the premises. Later in the day, as the roommates are judging a hard body contest, Hulk Hogan and Brian Nobbs scoff at the idea of any of these contestants actually having hard bodies. Those guys are supposed to be hard bodies? That's despite a lot of them actually turning and paying tribute to the Hulkster during their performances. Eventually, Hulk decides that he should enter the hard body contest, and ah, oh, god, god damn it, I just, I need a minute. <sighs> okay, so just to recap here, Hulk watched by the sidelines acting like a scorned lover as he jealously put down the participants his daughter was judging. And then he decided that he himself should enter the contest so that his daughter could judge his body. It is really unfortunate that Jerry Springer is dead because... I need him now more than ever. Uncle Nobsy even gets in on the fun, before giving one of the most brutal belly flops I have ever seen or heard in my life. Nobs is proclaimed as the victor, before being publicly pantsed. Brooke and company leave her family so they can host a phone party. I don't know what that is, but it doesn't sound like something I'd ever want to be a part of. Hulk, on the other hand, can't wait to find out what it is, as he makes his way inside the party after seeing it being promoted. No! What is this reaction? No! Which is kind of stepping over a line for Brooke, who is visibly upset with his presence. Hulk realizes he messed up and takes his exit. But only after Brooke promises him that they'll spend tomorrow together. And thank God, because he did not want to see what was going to happen next. Now, I don't know if any of you in my comment section are much more educated than me. Um, if you're not, let me tell you what a phone party is, or at least what my understanding of what a phone party is based on this. A phone party looks like all the worst parts of a rave, but now with gimmicks. You got foam filling up the room like you just entered a scrub and bubbles bottle. And you got people spraying chocolate syrup all over you, while Brooke Hogan makes out with fans and invites people to touch her. Man, I would pay so much money to never be involved with something like this. I, I would give you my life savings if it meant I never had to see or, or hear or know or be affiliated with this kind of thing in any type of way. Like, if I somehow stumbled upon this, I would be willing to empty my bank account just to get out of it. That sounds like the most unpleasant experience I, I could imagine. I mean, I don't know who these types of things are for, but just know that I hate you. Bright and early the next morning, the group are visited by Hulk and Nobbs, or as I will be calling them moving forward, the Nasty Maniacs. Oh, that's a, that's a gruesome tag team right there. They wake up the roommates to take them to the largest human maze in the world, 
Brooke and friends are not really all that psyched to be taking part in these tricks and traps, and decide to make it a two-team competition. Whoever gets to the end of the maze first gets to decide what they'll do for the day. While the younger group seem to look for a way out the old-fashioned way, Hogan and Nobbs are clearly playing heel, as they sneak out of the maze by going underneath the fence. Ultimately, they win, but at the cost of being ridiculed over the way that they've won. And because they've cheated, the gang go their separate ways and do whatever. That's the end of the episode. Episode 5, Brooke's Extreme Boyfriend. Brooke introduces Hulk to her brand new boyfriend, Bully Ray. Wait, no, that's not for a couple more years. Brooke attends a boxing event where one of the boxers asks her out on the date. She's quick to say yes, so I guess things didn't really work out with Damien. Sorry, better luck next time, Skippy. As it turns out, this boxer, Keith, is very into extreme sports. Uh, hence the title of the episode. And their dates consist of the two participating in these extreme sports, with Brooke doing extremely poorly. Comedy ensues when she leaves her father on hold so that she could take her potential boyfriend's call. It was Keith, I'm sorry. It was Keith. What the hell is this telling you about? Oh. Okay, well, what do you think I have chopped liver or Finally, she gets fed up and asks Keith to take her out on a nice normal date to which he agrees. But by time it's time for the date, he's sporting a big old black eye from a sparring session gone wrong. Despite this, they still have a nice night. But the very next date, they're back to their regularly scheduled insanity, as Keith invites the daughter of a wrestler to watch him wrestle an alligator. You can wrestle me any day. <laughs> Brooke ultimately breaks things off, feeling that they're not quite the right fit. Also, I would be remiss for not mentioning that the tracks used in this episode might sound a little bit familiar to wrestling fans, as both the Hardy Boys original theme song and even an old WCW theme are used. But I can't, for the life of me, remember whose theme it was. What is that music? Episode 6, The Guest from Hell. Like I said before, this show is a lot more formulaic than the previous one. We went from a house party that got out of control to an unwanted house guest. These are just classic sitcom tropes. Glenn asked the girls if his buddy Ray could possibly stay at the place for a while. Brooke agrees, noting that Ray's a sweetheart and would be welcome in her home. Just as long as no one tells her father that there's a straight guy living at the house. Okay, so this really is becoming a threes company scenario. Well, this is a, a fours a crowd situation. But Brooke, you're 20 years old. You live under your own roof. What I'm saying is that Ray should just show up to the house like... What's daddy gonna do? Sue me? Instead, he shows up with boxes and bags of his prized possessions. Including, but certainly not limited to, a Guitar Hero remote and a lightsaber. Ray makes himself at home rather quickly, taking it upon himself to set the living room up to his liking and retroactively turning it into his room. Despite the hospitality that showed to him, he's relentlessly rude, shushing his temporary roommates as he plays. He even sleeps in the nude in the living room, with his unmentionables uh, needing to be mentioned and addressed as they're out on full display. He's messy, he leaves half-eaten food everywhere, he uses Brooke's brush in her toilet. And yes, Brooke has her own toilet, because of course she does. The guy even sneaks a girl into the house to hop in the hot tub and wakes Brooke up at 3 a.m. asking her to show him how to use it. And then furthermore, asks if she could use her bathing suit. He lives up to the title of the episode every chance he gets. But I think that's a big problem with this show. It's all a little too on the nose. Hogan Knows Best seemed to better blur the line in between what was real and what was fake. Brooke Knows Best kind of makes the distinction pretty obvious. Especially because when they touch on or address real issues, it's clearly chopped up and heavily edited in post. And when it's not real, the storyline seems super staged and set up. Which, you know, they are, but you're not supposed to know that. It's like it's not even trying to pass for reality TV. It's just, it's too funny to be anything but fiction. On top of that, I can't really imagine Glenn being friends with this guy. Anyway, matters go from bad to worse when Ray answers a call from Hulk Hogan and mentions that he lives there. Hulk decides to do some deep research and investigating, and sends Big Al over for some intel on this covert mission. Yeah, I'm sure Brooke won't be suspicious of her father's friend randomly paying her a visit. That's a normal thing that just happens at times. So the dog sniffs out crime and forwards the information he got over to the big man in red and yellow. Hulk, of course, questions if there's any chemistry between Ray and Brooke. Good looking. I mean, did him and Brooke have like chemistry or something? Did they get along? What's the deal? 
not a big guy, dude. No, I can't see Brooke being interested in him. And seriously, man, this has just gotten past the point of being unhealthy. There's a gazillion people in the world. You can't shield your kid from every single one of them. Nor should you when they're not a child anymore. After talking it over with her housemates and getting a pep talk from her dad, Brooke evicts Ray. Episode 7, Brooke's First Prom. The episode description reads, Brooke becomes involved with an organization that gives prom dresses to girls who are unable to buy their own, auctioning herself off as a date. And that is accurate. That, that is what happens. That's correct. Brooke meets up with her father to tell him that at 20 years old, she'll be attending her first prom. That doesn't work for me, brother. <laughs> Hulk tells her to watch out for high school guys because their hormones are raging. Dude, she's 20. They're kids. She's 20. Oh man, th these people are not getting any less weird with time. There is one relatively real moment where Brooke breaks down over Nick and comments on the case in his prison stay. You know, I know Nick would never hurt John, like John was his best friend, you know? John was a negative person. He was what? He was a negative person. Wait, didn't Nick cause these injuries? Yeah. Yeah, he's saying that he wasn't a good guy, so, you know, the karma yeah. kind of uh, did that to him. Bashing the victim. John never meant anything to her or Ed. This is sad. She's not suffering. I am. I have a loss. She can give to you. Like John was his best friend, you know? But we need to brush all that realness aside because it doesn't have a place in this plot. Brooke takes this relatively nice young man to prom, to which her father still feels threatened enough to send him a threat. You ever see a movie called Rocky Three? My wrestling is all for charity. It's all for the ones that did him. Hulk, you are threatening a 17-year-old who's just trying to attend his prom. Hulk, therapy, try it. I'm begging you. Brooke is very sweet to the sweet kid, and the episode is kind of cute. Or, at least it was, up until the 14-minute uh, mark. The kids make their way to the bathroom. Why is there a camera following them there? I don't like it! Where nice guy Eddie, that's the kid that Brooke is taking to prom, where nice guy Eddie's buddy tries to convince him to take things a little bit further and try to get a kiss from Brooke Hogan. You can't leave. You cannot leave her alone without getting something. A kiss, a something. You gotta do something. Bad call, D-Bag Craig, if that is your real name. Which it probably isn't because I just thoughtlessly made it up. It's unfortunate because up until this point, things were going pretty smoothly. You know, I mean, like... It, it, it was cute, it was harmless, it was innocent, and then it became, oh god, it became uncontrollable cringe. Eddie just begins trying a little bit too hard. Um, trying it all would be too hard, but this is, this is trying too hard plus. Uh, it, this is trying uncomfortably hard, uh, and that's probably also what Brooke feels against her leg right now. At the end of the day, this is charity. Brooke's not gonna hook up with a high school senior, you know? It's just, it's not gonna happen. You shouldn't be treating this like it's an actual date because it isn't. You are one life-threatening sickness away from being a make-a-wish kid. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just saying that that's what it is. Honestly, this gets a little creepy. We're at the point where I may take back whatever bad I said about Hulk before in this episode. Because the guy clearly knew what he was talking about when it came to high school hormones. This is just, oh. Brooke should have came with a spray bottle or something because this kid just won't let up. But Ed's friend isn't done giving him bad advice. As he tells him to corner Brooke to get some alone time. Alright man, I, I really hope in the future someone's had a talk with this kid because I don't like the path that he is on. Whoever has been having talks with him prior probably should have a talk with the authorities. Cornering anyone is never a bright idea, but especially a woman, there's always going to be a weird context and connotation to that, even if there's no intent there. I can't really think of any scenario where cornering a woman wouldn't be the most aggressively creepy thing that one could do. So if you're watching my videos and want to learn how to approach women, uh, not this. Uh, do anything but this. This is actually never good uh, in any scenario. The night eventually ends with Eddie surprisingly getting his kiss and Brooke coming back home to tell the tale. Like it was straight out of Greece. Episode 8. Tattoo Me. Linda comes over to visit and finds out that Brooke is interested in getting a tattoo to celebrate her independence. Or in adult terms, Brooke wants to prove she's a big girl now. She tries to dissuade her daughter by telling her the importance and permanence of tattoos. 
while being reminded that both her and her ex-husband have their names and initials tattooed on each other. And Brooke's roommates are relentless with this fact. I got a little tiny heart, Terry's initial. Okay, time to get rid of that puppy. And Terry has the ring that says your name, even though it doesn't really mean anything now. Read the room, guys. This is a very recent divorce. These wounds haven't healed yet. There's no reason to be throwing salt in them. Sometimes you gotta put soft edges on your words depending on the company that you're keeping. This is not the right time. This is not the right place. This is not the right person. Fine. Why don't you just, because you have a cute, sexy back. Mom, because that's a tramp stamp. Captain Hindsight! Captain Hindsight, please come in! God bless you, Captain Hindsight! God bless you! Ultimately, Brooke gets her first tattoo. A small music note behind her ear. That's pretty cute. Probably pretty painful due to where it is, but an awesome aesthetic. And within the first five minutes of the episode, the title is paid off and the story centering around it is completed. Yet we still have 16 minutes left. The Hulkster calls Brooke because he misses her and invites his daughter and her buds to, to go watch American Gladiators, the show that he was hosting at the time. Brooke wants to go, but she's afraid of her father seeing her tattoo. I'm only just now noticing that we're eight episodes in out of a 10 episode long season, and I've barely said a thing about Glenn and Ashley because no disrespect to either person, but in the show, they're not people. They're just Brooks props. They barely have personalities of their own on the show. They're just Brooks plus ones. Because you can't have Brooke interact with herself, so just throw these two into the mix also, and well, you know, whatever. The three travel to American Gladiators, spend time with Papa Hogan. Okay. Hey. Hey. What's up, baby girl? I missed you. I missed you too. And after some good old goofing off, Glenn and Ashley urge Brooke to tell her father about her tattoo. Hulk is none too pleased when he hears the news. It's pretty important to put ink on your body, Brooke. Your body's perfect. Hulk, please, I'm, I'm asking you to. I'm, I'm really, really, I can't, I cannot stress this enough. I am asking and, no, 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 I am imploring. I am imploring you to stop saying such creepy shit about your daughter. It's really easy to not be weird. It feels like you're being more effortful. And in trying to save herself, she throws her mother under the bus. We should have talked about something like this before you do it. You know, I just really... Well, mom actually came with me. Snitch. Your mom came with you. This is an adult woman being scolded for the way that she chose to use her body and then playing her divorced parents against each other to get out of it. It's just, it's just all bad, no good. And that, that is the story of the Hogan household. Brooke tries to suck up to her dad by playing dress up. Don't I look so cute? Yeah, you look cute. Hulk asks if he could have more of a role in his daughter's life, and dude, what, what more could you want? It's called Brooke Knows Best, and yet you're still somehow in every episode. She doesn't even live with you anymore, and you're still in every single episode. How much more involved could you be? You're about as involved in her life as you were in Postamania. What is that? Episode 9, Strip to be Fit. This show nearly killed Hulk Hogan in the last episode when his daughter got a tiny tattoo in a very concealable place. But this episode? This episode tries to get the job done. As Brooke and her mother Linda take a pole dancing class to keep fit. I don't think there's anything wrong with pole dancing. Uh, I don't know much about it. If you say that it's a legitimate exercise, then I I am not inclined to disagree because I don't know enough about it to disagree. I know nothing about it, but I'll tell you what I do know for a fact. I know that no matter how legitimate it is, it will never be legitimate enough for him to be okay with it. And uh, I know that he's upset that men have to exist around his daughter. So seeing her twirl around a pole probably is not going to help his insecurities and fatherhood. Brooke and friends go to the club under the guise of salsa dancing to lose weight. Eh, it's a pretty hard sell. I'm sorry, I mean, the, the pole thing, maybe. Okay, maybe. Oh man, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about that one. I don't know about that one. That's, uh, that's a no sell. Sorry, I just don't think a lot of people go to the club to work out. You know, most people just go to a gym. After some friendly chit-chat, they're put onto pole work. Brooke does what any young girl would do and asks her mother to work the pole with her. I've been told there's some merit to this as an exercise and even as an art form. I've never looked into it, but I'm an uncultured swine, so my mind immediately just goes to stripping each and every time. But that's again where my mind goes. I don't know, am I crazy here? Like, I feel like I'm generally speaking, like, it would be weird to work out with your parent. Like, I, I don't really see a lot of mother-daughter, father-son gym partners. 
Uh, but then you add pole dancing into the mix, and that just it feels all, all the much more stranger. After a workout routine, Brooke buys a pole of her own and has it installed in her house. The pole becomes the talking point of the night, with the group encouraging Ashley and Brooke to show how they use the pole. To which Brooke drops a sick Stacy Keebler reference. Miss Hancock? Yeah. The routine is filmed and put on the internet, where it gets to Jimmy Hart, who places a call to Hulk Hogan. They've got you on the internet in some strip club dancing on a strip pole. Hogan rushes over in panic mode, thinking that his daughter has switched career paths. I told you this wasn't going to go good. He wasted a five-hour drive when he could have made a two-minute call. Uh, and the episode ends with Hogan dropping this nugget of knowledge. It just got on the internet. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, now you understand how these camera phones can become your enemy. Yep, there it is. There it is. There's that hindsight horror I've been missing. Why is it in the living room? Why would you have this? Why don't you put it somewhere where we don't want to put it in the bedrooms? Good point. Episode 10, the old college try. So like a lot of what's come before this, this episode is a tired trope that you've probably seen done better somewhere else. Ashley's looking to go back to college. And this has got Brooke thinking maybe she should try this whole college thing out herself. Again, the acting is so hammy and the tropes are so goofy that it's hard to take any of this seriously. Brooke at first talks about college as if it were elementary school, asking Ashley why she'd want to be yelled at by teachers. But once college is explained to her, which by the way, blows her mind, she reacts like Katy Perry making small talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson. She decides that she too wants to do the college, and her friends respond by laughing in her face. Maybe I should go. <laughs> well, like, it's unbelievable I could actually learn something. Which is the correct response. Brooke suggests going to college as a potential alternate path for her, because this music thing isn't working out the way she'd hoped, and she can't ask her family for help as they're going through enough of a crisis. Mentioning the divorce and what's going on with Nick, and even giving the victim of the crash a name drop as well. It's really strange for me to see just how open this show is about all of that. It feels like they probably shouldn't have been. you think that this would be something that was intentionally glossed over or looked past, but it's been referenced quite a bit this season. Ashley brings Brooke along with her to college interviews? Uh, sorry, I say that with a question mark because I didn't go to college myself. I'm actually uh, surprisingly very poorly educated. But honestly, this just reminds me of that scene from Step Brothers where they're interviewing as a team. Brooke is very much the fish out of water here. Which makes sense as Ashley looks like she wants to drown her throughout most of the runtime. What Ray was to being a good house guest, Brooke is to being a good student. I can completely see why she was concerned with being yelled at by teachers, because I'm a viewer and, and I want to scold her. And I didn't even go to school often enough to have these types of things bother me. But at least the only person I ever stopped from getting an education was me. It's very clear to everyone that this isn't the greatest fit. But Brooke still wants to see it through, even if she complains about maybe having to give up her music career to take college courses nobody actually expects, wants, or even suggests she take. Brooke calls up her dad and asks for advice. She asks if he thinks that she should go back to school or follow her dreams. She does a lot of thinking and soul searching until ultimately she decides she's much happier making shitty music. And you know what? I'm, I'm clowning on her, but like, good for her. I don't like what she makes, but she does seem happy making it and that's kind of all that matters. It appeals to her and it makes her life worthwhile, by God. Let her have this. I think we're supposed to think, oh no, Brooke might fall off her path, but the show's still airing on VH1. And Brooke was also shown to be a terrible student. So, you know, the stakes aren't really all that high when it's obvious you're working with a safety net. Overall, I think that Brooke knows best is an interesting watch. On one hand, this takes place at the height of the Hogan drama and acts as a small window inside their lives outside of the tabloids at the time. But being that it's Brooke's room that that's a window into, we're really only given brief glimpses of the bigger picture. It goes to the same weird and borderline bizarre places that Hogan Knows Best goes to, but it's now filled with filler and overstuffed with fluff. It takes longer to get there, and when we get there, the moments aren't as impactful as they once were before. So that was the first season of the show. 
and there is only one more left to go. Problem is, is that Brooke Knows Best Season 2 currently only has 9 episodes out of its 10 available. The Brooke Knows Best series finale is still missing. So if any of you internet detectives, you online sleuths, you historians and scavengers are somehow able to find the final episode, please do and send it my way. Just know that there is a search going on for it. And if you do so, you will be properly credited in my follow-up video. So if you know a guy, or you know a guy who knows a guy, or know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy who knows another guy, you get one of those guys on the case. I probably wouldn't have been able to find this without Zach at Double ZTV helping me out and sending me the show. So for all of you guys out there asking me to review Brooke Knows Best, you owe that guy a huge thank you. Feel free to either give him a subscription or a thank you here in the comments. The Hogan's put the fun and dysfunctional one last time in the second and last season of Brooke Knows Best. If you've been following this series from the start, then welcome back. What a journey it's been. After all that we've been through, we're finally pulling up to the final destination. And we're starting off strong. But before I get into this episodic breakdown of a long-forgotten show, I first once again have to thank Double ZTV for helping me find the footage for this season. And I also have to thank Randoms for getting me this series' series finale, because it was thought to be completely lost. And now I can give you the complete Brook Knows Best experience. Although I don't think that's something anyone was asking for. Episode 1. The final season starts off with a bang, and then continues to question who's banging who. The episode starts with Brooke and friends watching one of the many news reports at the time that was surrounding her family's public-private life. As at this time, Linda had just started a relationship with a guy younger than her daughter and the same age as her son. It's just weird to me. He's like my little brother. He's the same age as Nick. Ew. I spent 30 years destroying my body to build that house, and some kid that's 19 years old lives in that house. If that's not bad enough on its own, then add on to it that this dude was a classmate of Brooks. Also keep in mind that her mother left her father for cheating on her with one of Brooks' friends. Is it too much to ask that you look outside your children's inner circles to find dates? I feel like that's bare minimum. But things get just as weird when Brooke visits her father and tells him that his new girlfriend looks like her. You know, what's so crazy is that that looks like Jennifer. But oh, me. stop. <laughs> what? No, it's okay. Run. She's older than me, but she looks like me. Yeah, I, w I wish you all would stop, actually. Or alternatively, start uh, going to therapy. This family puts the complex in Oedipus Complex. Brooke agrees to meet her dad's new girlfriend over dinner. And when they do meet, they're huddled together like this. I've heard of close families before, but this is, this is too close of a family. Like, like actually, like, like physically. How are you? Wow. I like how tall you are. You're in your heels. Yes. It's so good. I can compete. I need to match you. Let's go. <laughs> I just wanted you and Brooke to hook up. Um. See, now normally I would think that there's a generational gap in slang, but given everything I've seen about this family here, this is probably just a Freudian slip. The date is comedically awkward with the two not having that much to say to one another, and Brooke not wanting to give her potential new stepmom a chance. Though the following day, out of no reason in particular, she decides to stop ignoring her father's girlfriend, and instead starts interrogating. It's here that she shares some delusions that she has about her dad. He is so very respectful. He's definitely old faithful. I don't, I don't think I'd use the word faithful to describe Hulk. Like, no offense to him. I'm not judging. I'm just saying it feels like an inaccurate word used to describe him. Hulk tries to break up the conversation to no avail. And it's here that the huckster starts to see the error of his ways. Uh, sort of. You got to spend all that time with all my boyfriends, and I don't get to spend time with your girlfriend? I think that's a little unfair. I don't like this. I was worried that she'd be doing the same thing to you that I used to do to the guys that used to come over. <laughs> Couldn't live by rules for thee and not for me forever, pal. The next day, Brooke and friends join Hulk and Jennifer, where they're set to take a ride in his boat. But when they get to the docks, he reveals that he's actually lost his boat in the divorce, so now they have to ride around in a tiny rental boat. I think this is supposed to be played for laughs, but it's actually really sad. And there's going to be a lot of moments like that in this season. As a matter of fact, there's going to be one right after the sentence. 
Because making matters worse is when they steer toward Hulkster's old place, Brooke has a complete breakdown after seeing the dogs in the backyard. Can we say hi to Cookie real quick? No, I can't. I can't pet Cookie? Brooke, I can't pull in there, otherwise your mom will have me put in jail. I can't. This series has always been blatantly bizarre, but as time goes on, it starts to get deeply depressing. It feels like a really personal time for this family. When Nick wrote me that letter, the third day he was in solitary confinement in jail. It's raw and real and really doesn't belong on reality TV. But that's also why I think it's so fascinating. They're constantly crying and clashing. It's full of really private matters to be so public. And because of that, it makes it really hard to look away. Throughout the episode, Brooke has been dodging her mother's calls. Brooke is basically silently disowning her mother for a choice and significant other due to a significant age gap. When was the last time you talked to your mama? About six months. Wow. Yeah. My dad admitted that, yes, he did some things wrong. But he came to me and he was like, I love you. And my relationship with you is more important than any relationship with anybody else. She has completely excluded me from her life, you know? And if I want to be part of her life, I have to put up with Charlie, which I just don't condone or agree with. How's Brooke doing? She's done things that I don't totally approve of, you know? She's dated a few guys that I'm going like, hmm. And it isn't until the end of the episode where she accepts her call and the two talk. Don't expect a feel-good moment here, either. You come into town and you don't even call. Just get over it and let's move on. Because the first installment in this last season doesn't end with the two making up. It just ends. What a downer. Episode 2. Things get weirder in Episode 2. As we pause the real-life drama going on with the Hogan clan and instead go straight into sitcom territory. We're talking full threes company here. You see, since Glenn the gay roommate hasn't had a lot of luck with dating dudes recently, Brooke decides that she should set him up with a chick. What if you have a little bit of straight left in you? What if you try to date a girl? You're straight, you're straight, and I'm gay. I still think that you have the potential to be straight. But no, I know who I am. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's how that works. Ultimately, it's decided that Glenn will go on a date with a girl if Brooke and Ashley also go on a date with a girl. You gotta let them think that you're into them. You gotta not let the person know that you're straight, and there's gotta be a kiss. Oh good, so potentially get someone interested in you, gaslight them into thinking that you're into them, and then let them down without rhyme or reason. Yeah, that sounds fun. Having this proposition brought up to her, Brooke is adamant that she doesn't like girls. And neither does Glenn. Sounds like a pretty open and shut case right there. But we can't end it there, because we need an entire episode full of moments of Brooke not understanding how sexuality works. I'm not necessarily offended. I'm just mostly bored. Brooke's dad calls. There's the girl I love. What's she doing? And Glenn lets it slip that Brooke is going on a date. Which, as you might imagine, doesn't work for him, brother. You talking about your date? What date, Brooke? Brooke, what, what date? Brooke, Ashley, and Glenn meet their dates, where they desperately try to disguise their orientation. Badly. Glenn and his date dirty talk over dinner, Brooke gets mad at a waiter for misgendering her date, and Ashley's date stands up to a dude who won't stop hitting on them. The three end up kissing their dates goodnight, but realizing that despite the goodnight that they had, they're all rather unchanged by it. And in the end, nothing is learned because there is nothing to learn. This is probably the most cringe-inducing episode of this show or its parent series. I mean, there's been way more cringe-worthy moments, but at least they felt entertaining, you know? They, they were fun. The problem isn't that this episode is weird, it's that it's weird and weak. Episode 3. Ashley and Glenn are out clubbing while Brooke is out working when they're recognized by a man with a proposition. You and Brooke, uh, like, make uh, an appearance uh, in my yacht uh, for this weekend. What kind of appearance do you want? Are we going to be speaking? Is it like a business party? Don't worry about it. Uh, okay. you, you have a fun. Maybe 20 grand. Oh, no. He, he can't mean what he obviously does mean, right? Party on a yacht? Asking to be accompanied by beautiful, semi-famous women? putting a price on their appearance and not asking for a performance? This show just goes there, huh? Ashley, not fully understanding what she was getting involved in, brings this business proposition up to Brooke, who of course decides to take this strange stranger up on his offer. Both girls are horrified to find that the party is very handsy with very little regard for personal space. 
Wow, it's like hopping on a boat with strangers and sailing out into the middle of nowhere was a bad idea. Because of the implication. She's out in the middle of nowhere with some dude she barely knows. You know, she looks around her, what does she see? Nothing but open ocean. Ah, oh, there's nowhere for me to run. What am I gonna do, say no? The girls very quickly learn what they should have already known, and Brooke understandably doesn't handle it all that well. I just wanna get off. Very poor choice of words. The man who made the offer to get them there throws himself at Hulk Hogan's favorite child in a pretty painful manner, the whole time. Until ultimately, the two girls go overboard. Let's get off this boat. I'm not staying here and being a high class hooker anymore. But they also have a hard time finding their way when they're on land. It might have been better being escorts for three more hours. Eventually they hop aboard another boat and are taken back home. The trip is rough and the girls decide to swim to shore with their bags in their hand. Now. Of course this is one of the episodes that was absolutely fully staged by the show. I mean, there's a lot of time when reality creeps into reality TV. And this episode was just all TV and no reality. But knowing that it's scripted is somehow even stranger to me because why would you script that? Episode 4. Well, the show just got real. It's the moment that none of y'all have been waiting for, as Nick Hogan makes his return to reality television. This show frames it as if it's a good thing, but I'm not really convinced that it is. The show wants its audience to be stoked to see Nick again, but all I can think of is... For some reason, man, God likes the heavy son of a kid. He's a negative person. I mean, that reality deal. Yep. Reality, how I'm getting back on my feet and uh, how I'm recovering after this celebrity out of jail. And apparently, it's all they can think about, too, as the group brings it up themselves. So those phone calls that we actually heard where you were, like, just going freaking the out. Because, you know, we heard all of it on TV. Mm -hmm. They really try to make Nick look like he's a changed man, and they lay it on thick, completely showing their hand. I've got a much healthier relationship with the big guy we got together with to raise money for uh, brain trauma research and brain stem cell research. Awesome. Which is awesome because then that'll help John. Oh yeah, that makes it okay. That makes it right. That's even Stevens. Even Stevens. Brooke and Nick go out to lunch and discuss their parents' divorce, where Nick seems to suggest disassociating as a way of coping. I just try not to pay attention to it, honestly, yeah. because it's if I if I do, it's too hard to deal with. It's weird for me to think that the four of us will never be like in the same room again. Like I said before, this season is really sad. Each one really captured the exact moments a marriage fell apart and followed the family coming to terms with it. When this show gets real, it's a real rough watch. But it's also hard to take your eyes away. Nick visits his mother, who asks him about Brooke. She's my chichi monger. I don't even know what that means, but I remember you I don't either, her. but they are my little girlfriend. Linda asks her son to help mend the fence between her and her daughter, to which he agrees. Nick reaches out to his older sister and asks her to reconcile with their mother, but Brooke isn't ready for a reunion. She tries to reason with Nick, but her reasonings don't seem as reasonable because of what it is that she's saying and who it is that she's saying it to. If I go over there, it's like I'm enabling her bad behavior. See, I can understand where she's coming from. There's some logic in that statement, but the statement loses logic when you realize the situation behind it. Yes, Brooke, talk about not wanting to enable bad behavior by having a relationship with your mother to your brother, who you do have a relationship with, who just nearly ended his friend's life in a drunk driving accident, caused him severe brain damage, and then blamed the whole thing on him. Somehow. Brooke discusses her dilemma with her roommates, who suggest that she go and visit her mother, to which she suggests that they come with her. But when the time comes for the three to go to the Hulkster's former place of residence, Brooke gets cold feet and has another breakdown. I just don't understand like how you could have a daughter and then just one day be like, well, you know, I found a new kid to take care of. She decides that she can't stand to see her mother with someone so young, believing him to be a bad influence on her and their relationship completely inappropriate. So instead, for some reason, she sends her two buddies in her place. Linda cries upon hearing that her daughter didn't come visit her, causing Nick to comfort her before taking his leave to talk with Brooke. Ultimately, Brooke doesn't wind up going to see her mother, and the episode instead ends with her being comforted by her brother and her father. I'm not ready to deal with that stuff right now. I'm sorry, baby. Much like the first episode, 
This certainly wasn't the conclusion I thought that we were gonna get. But then again, I didn't think that Nick Hogan resurfacing was in the cards either, and yet here we are. Episode 5. Brooke is working on a collaboration with Colby O'Donis, who is someone I knew before making this video. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with this guy, so I looked him up immediately, but Brooke then proceeded to say the same thing a current day Google search would tell you about him. Wait, who is he? He did a feature on Lady Gaga's Just Dance. Okay. And um, that's not all. He did um, Always Talking About What You Got, song with Akon. That's all. When the two singers get together, sparks fly. And as you might have guessed, that doesn't work for him, brother. Hulk proceeds to try to step in and make sure that these two artists don't duet. Uh, though to be fair to him, Colby's manager slash father certainly paints a picture. He plays guitar around girls, he melts their hearts. Stuff teddy bears drop their drawers when he starts playing. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Does anyone in Hollywood have a normal relationship with their family? You know what? I already knew the answer before I finished the sentence. Yes, let's just let's just move on. After Colby tries to impress Brooke with his guitar playing, just as Colby's father forewarned, Hulk decides to take his guitar and play so that he too can impress his own daughter with his own abilities. This is the hard body contest all over again. Hey, listen, that's nothing to snicker at. It was those specific skills that almost got him into Metallica. Brooke and Colby go to grab a meal, but don't invite their dads along for dinner, much to the Hulkster's dismay. Romance take its toll, dude. That statement is all the more strange when you realize that Brooke also dated that guy's son, Stax. Has anyone had a healthy relationship with anybody in Hollywood? The two wind up going on a date, and things seem to be going relatively well, with the two hopeful up-and-comers hitting it off. Meanwhile, back at Brooke's place, Hulk's hanging with his daughter's roommates, which is a perfectly normal thing to do. When Glenn decides to drop Trow, and hang dong to avoid tan lines. But he's not the only one, as back on the date, Brooke loses her bottoms in a tragic tubing accident. Luckily, there is a silver lining to every dark cloud, as this event was enough to inspire Colby to burst into impromptu song. Bizarrely, when Brooke and Colby meet back up with their dads, Brooke encourages Colby to tell them what happened on the date, to which Colby's father once again takes the opportunity to brag. I told you when he plays that guitar, panties come off. Multiple times. A dinner with the dads is had where things are just as awkward as they've ever been before. And while the two enjoy each other's company, things wind up not working out as Colby has to go on tour and won't be able to see Brooke for the next six to nine months. Oh well, easy come, easy go. Lasted about as long as any other fling that she's had on this show. Episode 6. These are the episodes I have a real hard time finding something to say about. It's another gimmick episode. Brooke, her friends, and her family are going to see who could be the best astronaut for some reason. And also, Glenn has a new boyfriend that he's seemingly obsessed with. The filler in this season is really odd to me. It's not the first time we've seen it thus far, and it's, it's far from the last. But these episodes especially feel out of place with all the serious stuff going on in the background. You go from addressing real-life issues that the Hogans were going through in the tabloids to suddenly playing pretend. You have the Hogans' bitter divorce, the hurt feelings of the children of divorce, Nick coming back from jail following a drunk driving incident, Brooke and Linda's estranged relationship, Hulk and Linda's public back and forth, and then you go to acting like Buzz Lightyear. Just cuz. But hey, at least the episode gave us this exchange. I'm gonna try to fly some rockets. <laughs> Just don't tell me about flying my dad's rocket. So it was all worth it in the end. Glenn also introduces everyone to his new boyfriend, who is a B actor, apparently. I, I just, I don't care. Not a whole lot to talk about here. This episode isn't really uh, integral to the Brooke Knows Best lore. I don't care about the A plot, the B plot, and I don't want to see it ever again. Episode 7. It's another dud. Glenn returns to his hometown with the girls, meeting up with his parents and ex fiance His former fiance keeps insisting that he's not gay and must be bi. Crazy, you're not gay. And she does this a lot. Are you bi? I'm not bi, no. So you're really gay? Making it clear that she's not over him and hasn't moved past the denial phase in grief. And Brooke isn't helping matters. 
You guys are so cute together. It's like, it's sad for me because I'm like, oh my God. Glenn worries about introducing his father to his boyfriend, but his mother reassures him of their acceptance, which is kind of wholesome. All goes well when Dan the boyfriend is introduced to the family. Although upon learning that he designs department stores, Glenn's dad says this. Some of those mannequins are pretty hot too, besides the clothing they're wearing. <laughs> you blow them up, don't you? I'm not sure what part of that sentence I'm most confused by. That he was into mannequins? Or the fact that he thought you can blow them up? The episode ends with Glenn giving a speech back at his old high school that gets a standing ovation. It's a nice sentiment, but it's not all that great of an episode. Episode 8. Guess what? It is another filler episode. The girls find a dog off camera and bring it home. They search for its owner, but also hope not to find one as they've already fallen in love with the furry little guy, naming him Nemo. Unfortunately, they already had a vacation planned, so they leave Nemo with Hulk and Nobs. He doesn't like you, Nobs. This gruesome twosome raids the fridge and grabs beers while trying to get the dog to do tricks. He does everything I tell him, just like all the jabronis in the WWE. Oh. Elsewhere on their trip, Glenn, Brooke, and Ashley are killing time as they head to their location. Never have I ever seen my parents having sex. You haven't? No, I haven't. Oh, lucky you. Shenanigans ensue as Hulk and Nobs walk the dog. And I'm not talking about Al Green. Though it, it would be funnier if I was. Oh, that's a cute baby you guys have. What was this one's name again? Uh, Spike Butch. When the group gets to their destination, they party the night away with Ashley leaving with some guy that she just met. Back at the VH1 house, Nobbs refuses to sleep in Glenn's room because it's too gay. So instead, he heads to Brooke's room to try to get in bed with Hulk, which is apparently far less gay. The dog's original owner shows up to pick the dog up, and Nobbs does a dance in celebration. It's only now that I'm realizing that Brooke has not shared a screen nor sat in a room with her mother this whole time. You'd think the show would focus on repairing their relationship, but instead we get dogs and hometown visits. Episode 9. Things are not getting better. When this show is not capitalizing off of real drama, it is creatively bankrupt and completely out of ideas. Ashley makes the house go green and gets extreme with it. It annoys everyone to no end, but at least it gives us this moment. All your cars and houses and stuff. First off, if we're going to speak factually, I don't have cars and houses anymore. The girls get into an argument over Ashley's aggressive green ways, but they wind up making up by the end of it. And I don't care. Remember when I said that this season was starting off strong? Yeah, well, it's finishing week. It's just going out with a whimper instead of a bang. So let's just hope that the series finale can make up for the last half a season. He's going through a divorce. <laughs> I got nothing. Episode 10. Here we are. The last and lost episode. This is what it all comes down to. Was it worth being found? Let's find out. Brooke's working on a new dance routine when she gets a call that her father's collapsed. He's living with such severe back pain that his legs went numb. The doctors show Hulk his spine and suggest surgery as an attempt to correct his issues, a procedure that he eventually decides to get done. And here's where the horror of hindsight comes back to rear its ugly head once again. These treatments did not go great for the Huckster. As a matter of fact, he'd later sue this institute to the tune of $50 million for unnecessary and unhelpful surgeries. Surgeries that he claimed ruined his career. But like a lot of Hogan claims, you can find evidence to the contrary. Evidence that is usually word of his own mouth. As at the end of the episode, Hogan praises the doctors that worked on him and highlights some of the ways the surgery was a success. You look like you're doing fine. I immediately relief. As soon as I saw them doing that, I could tell it was like the pressure was off my lower back. This little square here was always numb, now it's not numb at all. Which is also allegedly why this episode is so hard to find. Though I don't think I could fully buy that when you look at everything else on the show. Especially considering the fact that the Hulkster is wearing a Bubba the Love Sponge shirt on almost every episode of this season. There's plenty I'm sure he'd wish was cut. This is no worse than the rest of it. As a matter of fact, comparatively to everything else, this is tame. 
Brooke has a show coming up, but instead devotes her time and attention to her father and his recovery. That instead of being here rehearsing and taking care of business, you were taking care of me. That's not cool. Because I love you. Eventually, Brooke does get to perform. And it's, uh, it's something. It's definitely something. I wouldn't say it's something good, but it is, uh, something. I'm, of course, only talking about the dancing portion of this routine because the show doesn't exactly show you the singing. Instead, it plays the finalized track over the actual performance. Ashley Simpson, eat your heart out. Is it considered lip syncing if it's done in post? Right after doing her routine to a song called Strip, complete with poles and provocative dancing, Brooke immediately takes to the mic to thank her father for coming out and watching her, despite just going under the knife. I don't know, that just, that seems like weird timing. The episode ends with everyone commenting on how great Brooke was. And that is it. That is the end. That is Brooke Knows Best. The good, the bad, and the Hulk. I'm really surprised that Brooke and Linda didn't make up by the time the series came to an end. I thought for sure that that's what this season was building up to. But no. There's no resolution, there's just... Brooke dancing. There's no real conclusion here. And similarly... I have no real conclusion to make about the show after. After four seasons of the first show and two seasons of a spinoff, you'd think that I'd have something to say to wrap this whole thing up in a neat little bow. You know, my, my final thoughts segment. But no, I'm surprisingly out of words. I've said everything that needs to be said up until this point. So saying anything now just seems pointless. You've all seen what I've seen. I will say that this is a rather disappointing ending. It's certainly not a highlight of the Knows Best brand as a whole. As a matter of fact, I would say that this is an all-time low for it. But that's probably why it ended and wasn't picked up for another season. I guess it goes to show you that sometimes it really is just about the journey and not really the destination. So if you guys like this journey and would maybe want to hop in the car and ride on over to the next adventure, I don't know, maybe join me in taking a look back at wrestlers in other reality TV shows? Let me know in the comment section below by leaving a comment saying... Hey. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.